Right, so, my video on Jam was refreshed over 50 times in the space of a month, which is a number I just can't ignore, meaning the hunt for comedy gold gets a second episode. Yay, amazing. I'd put some celebratory special effects in here, but I don't know how, so yeah, just a bit awkward in it. Let's just get on with the video. So quickly, for those of you who didn't watch the first episode, and statistically speaking, it's incredibly likely that you didn't. I'm a fan of comedy. An incredibly high percentage of the shows I watch are sitcoms. My personality is essentially just a mismatch of lines and quirks from my favourite comedy characters. However, I think most comedy is terrible. The vast majority of what I'll describe as Channel 4 or Dave comedians just aren't for me. I find shows like Taskmaster or 8 out of 10 Cats Does Countdown about as funny as stepping on an upturned plug with my bare foot. So I'm trying to find more shows to watch. Shows that didn't get the funding or airtime to compete with the lowest common denominator crap that pollute our TV schedules and are lost in the back of streaming services. Are there hidden gems out there? Or is there a reason why people would rather watch hours upon hours of Ramesh Raghunathan over these shows? And today on The Hunt for Comedy Gold is... Live from his luxury penthouse apartment in London's glittering East End, Dean Lerner, club owner, entrepreneur and publisher of High Class Gentleman's Magazines, invites you to join him for an exclusive Man to Man. Man to Man with Dean Lerner ran for one series and is a spin-off from creators Richard Iwodi and Matthew Holness' cult TV show, Garth Marenghi's Dark Place. I absolutely love Dark Place. I think it's one of the best sitcoms ever made. I would have included it in this series, however didn't because A, I feel it's perhaps slightly too well known for this series and B, there are several other videos explaining the genius of the show out there on YouTube doing a much better job than I ever could so I'd recommend watching those videos then Dark Place itself if you haven't seen it already before continuing with this video. You done that yet? You have? Good, let's carry on. Dean Lerner, played by Richard Iwodi, was Garth Marenghi's publisher and co-star of Dark Place and the premise of this show is that he's gone on to be successful since the release of Dark Place and is now hosting his own talk show where he interviews some of his closest friends, man to man. I thought Lerner was, other than Marenghi, the standout character of Dark Place and Iwodi, someone who I'm actually not a massive fan of, played him so well, I was naturally interested in seeing the character in another environment. Dean's not an actor. I warned Garth, um, I said I'm not an actor and um, he said I'll always remember this that he didn't want an act, he wanted the truth. So um, here is uh, Dean Lerner playing Thornton Reed, not putting on an act, but putting on the truth. Flying objects, it beggars belief. Wait, I have more things to say. Go on, sorry for the interruption. Don't... I'm also a huge Alan Partridge fan, so anything that is in a similar format to Knowing Me Knowing You is automatically going to get my attention. So in theory, this show should be the comedy gold I'm so desperately hunting for. And is it? Well, let's give it a watch and find out. So Dean's first guest is of course Garth Marenghi, and Iodi and Holness just slot straight back into character. Dean explains a bit more how they met a horror publishing company, where he was publishing horror erotica. I wanted to release books that would give the reader a boner, but leave him too terrified to do anything about it. <laughs> And this show is essentially Dean stroking Marenghi's already hilariously inflated ego, as well as finding out what he's been up to since Dark Place. I think it's an excellent episode. The clip from Garth's latest film, War of the Wasps, is fantastic. It reunites the cast of Dark Place, with Garth playing Ken Douglas instead of Rick from Dark Place. Matt Berry is assumedly Todd Rivers as Lucian Sanchez, and Lerner is Thornton Reed again. As someone who loves watching terrible low-budget cliché film or TV, the way they nail every detail and mannerism is just fantastic. It's incredibly clever writing and directing, and the fact it's restricted to just one series and a clip is really upsetting because I could watch it for hours. At the rate she's travelling, I'd guess to make two mins. It's possible that that hospice was built right next to Britain's biggest jam factory, which in turn was constructed next to the Houses of Parliament. And don't forget, Dag, the one woman you love is trapped in there with them. Plus, in addition, a couple of the kids have got whooping cough. Good luck, ladies. I wish I could be up there with you, but I've got a bad back. You heard the man, let's try and get some jaspers. Fall in! Minus three o'clock, blue to make a back left, trying to do their fun. Such a stupid threat, let's make him disappear. Try this for size. Other highlights include Marenghi's new book, The Oeuvre, being all of his 400 books in one, which really made me laugh. 
and his new horror art exhibition where he's had every painting as a long detailed explanation of each one so the viewer doesn't have to think or get anything out of it. It's that you provide very extensive notes alongside the paintings um, which is great because there's no need to interpret them at all. I mean, you know, it's all explained. There's nothing like subtext or anything like that. So I managed to whittle around the whole exhibition in 15 minutes. Well, that's it. People are very busy, Dean. You know, they don't have time to go to an exhibition and think as well. So, <laughs> and to be honest, there's nothing worse than a work of art that leaves you asking questions. It's also a great way to show Marenghi's false sense of grandeur and the complete lack of self-awareness. He is probably the most underused comedy character of all time, having seen great characters like David Brent and to a lesser extent Alan Partridge be overdone and go stale, having a character like Garth Marenghi sitting there with much more to offer is very frustrating. Overall a great start to the series, however it does give you the urge not to watch the rest and just re-watch Dark Place again. Episode 2 reveals that Lerner used to run an F5 racing team called the Dean Team. The weird, random and shady past of Dean Lerner is something I enjoy a lot about this series. It's obviously not realistic, but someone so peculiar and odd becoming successful isn't realistic. And the humour I find is that Iodi and Holness could say that Lerner had done or been involved in literally anything and I'd buy it because the character is so well written as an anomaly. His guest for this episode is Steve Pissing, a former Dean Team member. I was won over by the character Pissing very easily. Following on from Marenghi was always going to be tough, and while there's lots of Marenghi in him, he managed to establish himself as his own being, which is credit to the writers, as it was going to be difficult. That being said, I found the gags around his name a little broad and repetitive for my liking. Him being incredibly monotone and over-explanatory is really funny. Not only does it put Lerner in an uncomfortable position, as his friend who he's invited on isn't fulfilling expectations, but also the fact he participates in motorsports, something that I'm not skilled enough at writing and lack the vocabulary to explain just how boring I find cards going round and round and round. I really don't know whether I, Holness and Iodi feel the same, but that's how I interpret it, and I find it really satisfying. Um, the feeling of speed was just indescribable. All right. So what was it like? <laughs> As I say, it's indescribable. Try describing it. <laughs> really good. <laughs> now, together we won a lot of races, but what for you was your finest moment? Well, I'd have to say probably Brands Hatch 85. I was leading solidly for 15 laps. Then on lap 16, I was taken by Henrik Gregor, the fiery Sri Lankan. I got angry, I put my foot down, I did this, and I was back on pole. <laughs> And that was the greatest moment of your life? Yes, it was. I mean, there was a moment immediately prior to that where I'd done this. And that was pretty special. I mean, I remember thinking, that's probably my greatest moment. But then that moment led to this, which blew the previous moment right out of the park. In fact, the only thing that's come close since is when I first saw the trailer to Troy. It's explained that the two of them now run a spare parts company together. Of course they do and they run a show called The Learner to employ a new member of staff, which is essentially a parody of The Apprentice. The part where Pissing explains how to stack shelves in extreme detail I particularly enjoyed. Anyone who's worked in dead-end, robotic, unskilled jobs will relate to the tediousness of the training and the patronising tone used by Pissing. Overall, another really funny episode. Okay, so just be very, very careful. Bring it up to the edge, but no further. And don't push it all the way back because then you might miss one walking through, okay? Because I walk past, go, where is it, where is it? And I've gone past it. It's literally up to that edge. That's why they were built this length, okay? That's why the width is right. It's just right for the job. It's just right for the job. You... I thought episode three was much weaker than the first two. Dean's guest is former sci-fi writer and actor Glyn Nimrod. Nimrod was the star of a NAF sci-fi show called Galacticops and is releasing his sixth autobiography as well as celebrating the release of his 300th film. There's a joke about Nimrod having an inappropriate, abusive relationship with the show's director which ultimately resulted in him being put on an estrogen diet to grow his own tits. This just doesn't land for me and takes up most of the first half of the episode. Just before the break, Nimrod catches fire because the skin healer he uses for his plastic surgery is highly flammable and conducts the second half of the show while he's being treated for the burns. Again, this doesn't work for me. I like my comedy to be somewhat realistic and this tips it over the line of plausibility and makes it a bit too wacky and slapstick. While I'd say this is a poor episode, two lines got really big laughs from me. The first being the one when Nimrod is talking about why the show's creator doesn't like the term sci-fi. Both we in the business never use the term sci-fi. It's SF. 
S F. That's right. S F for scientific fictions. Right. Not not sci-fi. Never sci-fi. De Manfred Graney, the wonderful creator of Galacticops, he despised the term sci-fi, like he despised Orientals. It's um. <laughs> I can only assume this is a reference to Yellow Peril in the 1920s sci-fi films and comics, something I actually looked at during my second year of university, so I felt like a fucking genius getting that one. Also, Dean's comment after reading Nimrod's autobiography is brilliant. And I'm so proud because we've managed to film you reading that book for DVD, and that should be out soon on the Dean VD label. Well, <laughs> well, that was on your suggestion, Dean. Well, yes, I mean, after reading your book, I thought perhaps it might be even more appreciated by the illiterate. Um, and, uh, and the thing is, if you can tap into the illiterate market, your quid's in, because they can't read the reviews. Um, Overall poor episode, but still very amusing in parts. <laughs> episode 4 is a little better than the previous, but there's kind of a feeling that they are running out of ideas by this point. Dean's guest is a folk singer called Merry Man Weir, who is a timid, depressed character, with the majority of his songs being about some kind of tragedy or upsetting moment. Almost the entirety of the first half of the show is just Merry Man trying and failing to play his own songs, which is funny I guess, however personally I find the dialogue between Lerner and his guest the funniest part of this show, so to essentially waste half a show of that was disappointing. It's revealed that Dean is his manager and takes almost all his money from his records, and that Merry Man is re-releasing one of his old albums which only sold around 12 copies the first time around. Overall, it was a bit of a nothing episode. I like what they were trying to do in parts, but it just didn't quite land with me. Episode 5 is a bit of a return to form. I enjoyed it far more than the previous two. The guest is Amir Shanan, who is a very strange, I think German but could be Austrian, Holness's accent is a bit off, psychic, and he is pretty much a satire of Yuri Geller. He is blessed with the skill of key bending, which is clearly a piss take of Geller's spoon bending trick. When did you first realise you could bend keys? I was about six years old. I was lying in my bed. I was ill. And all of a sudden I heard a knocking coming from the window. I was terrified. I got up, I went over to the window, I pulled back the curtain and I saw a huge finger pointing at me from outside. And after a moment or two, it spoke to me, saying, Fear not, Amir. I am the finger of Orion, and I bring tidings from the mighty hand of Rastaban. I have traveled through space and time to touch you, for I touched the caveman, and he knew fire. I touched Newton, and he knew gravity. And now I am touching you, and you will know how to bend keys by rubbing them lightly between thumb and forefinger. <laughs> Yale, deadlocks, luggage keys, all of these will be yours for the bending, but <laughs> this is a mighty power, Amir, and you must wield it responsibly. That's what it said. It's quite a specific power to have been granted, isn't it? <laughs> just, just keys. Shanann tries to psychologically manipulate the audience into watching to the end of the episode and records a series of short motivational videos that play sporadically throughout to help keep the audience's attention. Maybe I should start using them for this channel. Seriously guys, uh, please don't turn off. Keep going! There's a weird skit with Shenan in the bath, which doesn't really land with me, but the episode finishes strong with its final two bits. The first is Shenan answers psychic questions. Little details like the first caller being Sandra from Ipswich really got to me. No disrespect to all the Sandras in Ipswich, but for me that just absolutely nails the demographic of people who believe in this bollocks. Shenan's answer to if he believes in God is brilliant too. Yeah. I would say that knowing all I know and having learned all that I have learned, it is all nonsense. There is no God. There is no afterlife. We are all just organisms controlled by a giant cosmic salamander who has planted <laughs> tiny metallic water boatmen in our brains to spy on our minds. You heard it here first. <laughs> this is clearly a mocking of Scientology or any of those other made up religions. The show ends with Shanann storming off after failing to bend a key which while was obvious and not delivered quite as well as it should have been, I still enjoyed it. A much better episode in my opinion. Don't go away! The final episode of the series is a good one. Lerner's guest, actor Randolph Kaya, dies shortly before he's meant to go on the show, so Dean instead makes the show a tribute to his life. The ongoing joke is that Randolph is very unpopular and not respected among his peers, as well as being incredibly unattractive. 
This is mainly told through some of the previous guests returning to pay tribute or tell anecdotes about him. Kai's big break as an actor came in a film adaptation of one of Garth Marenghi's books called Bitch Killer, and Marenghi returns for a cameo, which I was happy about, but wish it went on a bit longer. Um, it's actually not a bad time for Randolph to go, because it does at least give us a decent press angle, and uh, journos are less likely to stick the boot in while he's still warm. I also enjoyed the cameo from Shanam, where he tried and failed to communicate with Kai from beyond the grave. I think there's potential with Shanam as a character. I think I'd find his short temper and delusional grandeur much funnier if we knew a bit more about him. I think this is one of the main downfalls of the show. Many of the mannerisms and traits of these characters are not established enough for the audience to recognise. It works in Marenghi, as we know about him from Dark Place, but as far as I'm aware, all these characters debut on this show and are not seen again. To build up a comedy character in one 25 minute episode is a really tricky task and something they don't always pull off. I think my favourite skit is Kaya reading an incredibly sombre children's bedtime story called The House for No One. I'm going to completely contradict everything I just said a sentence ago, but I do think they absolutely nailed Kaya's character. An unfashionable, depressed actor who's been pigeonholed into a role and unpopular among unlikable people, which ultimately makes him seem alright. He reminds me of a kind of over-exaggerated version of Andy Millman from Extras. There's a bit where Kaya plays the father of the Goss brothers from the band Bross. I wouldn't say it was overly funny, but it reminded me of the Bross documentary from a few years ago, which is one of my all-time accidental comedy highlights. Check it out if you haven't, it's class. The episode was a good, satisfying end to the show, and while I enjoyed it, I was somewhat glad there wasn't any more. Whether I'd recommend Man to Man to someone depends entirely on whether they're a fan of Dark Place or not. The more you enjoy Dark Place, the more you'll enjoy this show. Overall, I say it was a good solid comedy, regular laughs, an original concept, and good characters. I felt they were running out of ideas by the end, but given the talents of Iodi and Wholeness, I would like to see them try something different with a few of these characters as I believe there's potential there. In comparison to Jam, I'd say it's considerably more normal and the majority of people will prefer it, but I found Jam more interesting and marginally more funny, so I'm going to place this second on the hunt for gold list. That's all for now, thanks for watching. If you have any suggestions of other comedies I should explore on this series, please let me know. We hit the big 3-0 subscribers recently, so cheers for that. Especially if you've subbed and I don't know you in real life, it really means a lot. This video is dragged, so yeah, I'll see you when I next have something to make a video about.